Our species for tonight is the Vidler's Alpine, and uh, this is actually one that we've never done, and part of the reason is because we never completed burying it. <laughs> wow. uh, it it's a tough one. Rubia Vidleri, the Vidler's Alpine. The uh, Vidler's Alpine is, is, is one of the uh, um, butterflies of one of the brushlets in the group we call satyrs or satyrids. And it's uh, basically a black butterfly with uh, orange spots on the wings. Uh, as you can see here, the, uh, the shape and pattern of the orange spots is one of the ways you, you separate this from, the, from its uh, nearest relative, which we'll show a little later. Uh, Vigorous Alpine flies mostly in high elevation areas. Uh, and it, it uh, lays its eggs. Uh, frankly, I don't know how it lays its eggs because we've never documented how it lays its eggs in the wild. This is in captivity, uh, and they, they lay their eggs on little red sticks. <coughs> uh, the visitors, uh, Alpine flies mostly in high elevation areas. Alpine areas, uh, uh, places like Slate Peak up in the North Cascades is, is one place where you can. Uh, usually find them. <clears throat> eggs are pretty good size, 1.1 1 .1 millimeter. That's a pretty big egg. And here's what they look like after they've matured a bit. The uh, larvae, when they first hatch, are little pink things. They're kind of attractive little guys with red stripes. And uh, they, have, they have little sepia or hairs on their heads. And each of the little dark spots on the body also has the tiny little or see this sticking out. And as they grow older, the pink color disappears. They turn uh, this brownish color, develop a big white stripe down the side. Now, these are, uh, these are larvae that feed on grasses and sedges. Again, we don't have a lot of information on which grasses or sedges uh, because it's really, really, really hard to find these larvae. Uh, and so what we have is essentially we, we uh, try to rear them in captivity and whatever they eat in captivity, uh, uh, we know what those plants are, but that doesn't uh, mean that we know what they feed on in the wild. You can see at this stage, third instar, uh, which is uh, pushing a half inch long, uh, it develops, the larvae develops quite a number of these stubby little CP, both on the body and, and on the head. You can see them there too. And we're starting to see on the tip of the abdomen this, this little kind of a paired appendages, and that's kind of typical of any of the satyrids. This is an older one. This is uh, second to last instar, 14 millimeters. And uh, again, again, uh, at the tip of the tail or abdomen, you can see a two little horns sticking back. These are the tails um, of the satyrids. And here's the final instar. This is a little less than an inch long. They probably get a little longer than this, but this is about as far as we got them. I thought by we, I mean David James and I when we were rearing uh, larvae for the book. Uh, the species, or well, yeah, it's the same size. It's, it's, a, it's the same individual. You can see the, uh, the CT are dark and contrasting, and they're pretty much all over the body. Again, here's your look at these two little tails. They're pretty short at this stage. And uh, we did not get the species through to pupae, uh, and so I pulled this off of the internet. This is actually European Arabia. Uh, they're probably all, all pretty similar. The Arabias tend to have pupae that look pretty similar, uh, and, and so ours probably look very similar to these. Here again is the adult, um, and this is up in the North Cascades. Uh, the habitat that it particularly likes. They, they dip on just about anything with cow's nectar. Uh, again, if we look at the orange spot on the ventral side of the forewing, you see that the edges of it are kind of jaggy. You see those jaggy areas around the edge of it? And that's one of the things that separates it from the common alpine. Here's the dorsal view of the vidlers. Uh, again, notice how jagged uh, the, the edge of the orange patch is. There's actually several different things that separate vidlers from the common alpine, uh, but that's one of the best field marks. This is the common alpine here, and you can see how the orange patterns don't have that jaggy look. They're a little blurry, but they're pretty much smoother. Let's go back and look at their uh, vidlers again. See that jaggy area compared to a smoother 
period. The, uh, one of the things that was pretty interesting about this butterfly, let's see what I next, yeah, here's the habitat. Uh, one of the things that was very interesting is we tried to rear this a number of times, and uh, we would get it through. Uh, the first year, it would, it would uh, the eggs would hatch, and we'd get these little larvae, and they obviously went into diapause, so we had to overwinter them. And the next year, they'd start out okay. We'd feed them various kinds of grasses instead of just trying to find something that they liked. And they would go glacially slowly. And that's kind of typical of the, of the butterflies of this group. They're very, very slow. And it's kind of like watching paint dry, but you watch it all summer. Um, and then uh, the frustrating thing for us is we'd get up to uh, August or, or September, and they simply stop feeding. They would just sit there and sit there stationary. They clearly were going into diapause again, and we could not get them to keep going to develop onto pupa. That's why you don't have any pictures of pupa. And so finally it dawned on us, uh, one thing that had never been documented before, these have to be double rooted, or not double rooted, they have to be biennial, which means the adults fly every second year. Now this is a big surprise because the adults fly every year. So how can this be? And the only reasoning we can come up with, somebody have a suggestion? How that could happen? One group comes out one year and the next group. Yeah, now you got two different populations. And well, so you have to, sometimes you have three, three, it takes three years to get through, too. Mm -hmm. And some years, it only takes one year to get through. So, like, you know, if the outside, if you had enough sample size, you'd find that while these things may be traditionally biennial for the most part, there's always going to be some to get through in one, and always going to be some to get through in three. So the genetic exchange between these two different cores is actually pretty free. Mm -hmm. So there's probably not a lot of difference in, uh, in the genetics. Uh, and, and yet we have pretty healthy populations, I think, like at this location at, at Slate Peak. We have pretty healthy populations every year. And as far as we can tell, the ones there, uh, every time we try to root them, they're biennial. And uh, uh, Guppy and Shepard, with, with their book on uh, the butterflies of British Columbia, a very good book, by the way, they, in, they indicated that several other species of Aridia are biennial but not this one. Nobody has indicated that this one was, and so it came as, as quite a surprise for us. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, <laughs> that's, that's what the mark looks like. You see it right there. <laughs> and that's uh, all I have for uh, Victor's outline. Uh, anyone have questions? Uh, do those, because we have been Washington at high elevation, does that mean that they exist in North America further north at lower elevations? Further south, yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably so it's that elevation yeah. kind of comes down and down as you go further north. Then. Right, right. And what we found is that with a lot of these biennial species, we don't have a lot of them here, but the several we have, if you get the same species in California, uh, they can develop in a single year. So it takes two years here, and then further north, we can even, like, like John said, they might even take three years. Yes. And related to that was uh, the, the range of good variety only includes Washington and British Columbia, and even a small part of both of those areas. And that's the full range in the whole world. Their nearest relatives are in uh, Japan, Sakhalin, and, uh, and the Alps of Europe. So this is a really unusual butterfly in that genus worldwide. Uh, as to uh, you know where you know, it might be by or, or or even tri thing, you can't really tell. I think it's kind of a crapshoot even with uh, Aeneas nemodensis. Since climate change has become a, a, a topic, uh, that one butterfly, uh, which is, used to be restricted to eye years only, has now uh, got at least three or four even year colonies that are reliable in the state. So that cohort jumping around can happen pretty readily, you know, given the opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, that, that this species did not occur in California, but some of the other satyrs that we reared uh, are, are biennial here and uh, annual. In other words, they, they developed in one year in California. So the, the folks in California were able to get us pictures of pupae that we just couldn't get through. Rearing the biennial species is really difficult. Uh, first of all, you don't get that many through the first winter, and the ones that you get through, they've got to go through another winter yet. So, you uh, lose, you lose all of them you know, most of the time. Did, did you mention the Olympic Mountains in your, in your distribution? No, I haven't. They're, they're pretty abundant in the Olympics. 
I, I haven't actually done anything with them in the Olympics. I know they appeared there. And they're, they're common, like I say, at Slate Peak and uh, north of Winthrop, there's an area by a freeze out mm -hmm. pass where they're common. And that's about the border, I think. I don't know if they go any further east than that. Mm -hmm. I've seen I think much of pack is about as far east as they get yeah. in Washington. Yeah, that's pretty limited range. Did somebody answer? Yeah. Yes. Um, since you've been collecting at Slate Peak, there was a large burn there probably five or six years ago. Did you see any change in the population? The burn didn't hit the part of, of Slate Peak that we're most interested in for butterflies. It hit the big canyon, the one that goes down toward, uh, um, what's the little town down there? Mazama. Mazama. That goes down toward, that, that area just got nailed. I mean, it was burned down to the dirt. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, the high country, as you get to the top of the ridge going up to Fort Slate Peak, and then you turn right or north up to the up to the peak itself, that area did not get burned. It got pretty well doused with smoke, and a lot of plants looked pretty sick the next year, but they, they all recovered. So what the area where you collect is not around the campground area, it's farther up toward the actual peak lookout there? You've got to run above Harkis Pass. Yeah, go, go further right. Okay. Go clear to the end of the yeah. road as far as Harkis Pass. Pass. Yeah, go clear to the end of the road as far as, it, as your car can take you. Uh, actually, the Vidler's Alpine is the best area, if you know where the horse corral is. Uh, around that area is actually a very good area for Vidler's. Yes? The fifth green star larvae you had was something 20-some millimeters. Millimeters. So I just, this is just a, uh, I just need to translate that in centimeters. Is it that like 0.2 centimeters? 2.1. 2.17? Yeah. 21 millimeters. Oh, that's better. I was going to say That's why they call it the memory. Come on, man. There's <laughs> 25, 25 millimeters is an edge for us Americans. You Americans. It's still pretty small, though. Yes, anybody else? So how, how big is the adult if the fifth instar larvae? The adult butterfly? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of guess. It's probably a little under two inches wingspan. Oh, that sounds so good. Yeah, something like that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you.